All right, hello. My name is Thomas Sibley, as Josh just told you. Um, I'm here today to talk about modern software development in a biology research lab. Um, I'm going to use the term scientist and science fairly loosely, um, but just keep in mind that my experience is in biology, and you may find, or your mileage may vary in physics or chemistry or things like that. Um, so I work in the Mullins Molecular Retrovirology Lab at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, and that's kind of a mouthful. Um, yeah, go Huskies. Um, but molecular retrovirology means that we look at viruses with RNA genomes uh, and the interaction of these viruses with the molecules in human cells. Uh, we approach questions about the evolution of these viruses and their interactions using a variety of wet lab techniques at the lab bench um, and dry lab bioinformatics techniques at the computer. Um, each informs the other and often exploration of questions ping pongs back and forth between the wet lab and the dry lab and the wet lab again and so on and so forth. This is a diagram of HIV which is the virus that the lab primarily studies. Um, so my responsibilities cover everything involving a computer in the lab, basically. Um, from analyzing data to writing new applications to even managing our racks of hardware down on the second floor. Um, I've been in the lab going on for four years now, um, or just about four years, um, and I've helped modernize existing applications and also kick off brand new ones. So you've probably heard horror stories about the kind of spaghetti write-only code that academic research produces. Uh, or even worse, maybe you've looked at the BioPerl source code. Um, that's a cheap shot, but I'm here to tell you that not all software and science has to be terrible. Um, and this will be a talk in three acts. Um, in the first act, I'll explore this idea of the last mile, um, as I think it applies to software and science, or at least software and biology. Um, in the second, I'll talk about the kind of work I do in the lab and show examples of improvements we've made to the computing practices viewed through the lens of lessons that I've learned in the lab. Um, in the final act, I'll talk about why you too might want to work in a science lab. So let's get started. Uh, the Mullins lab, where I work, has been around for 23 years at UW and 12 years before that at both Stanford and then Harvard. Um, that's a lot of time to generate data, and some of the lab's ongoing projects span decades, with new data being collected from the very start up until now. Um, this plot shows the collection dates of samples that the lab manages and works with. Um, and you can see that the x-axis starts back in 1985 uh, and goes up to the present. The success of those projects is directly related to the lab's ability to make sense of the data over time and not lose it to the frequent turnover of students and postdocs or misplace it amidst shelves of lab notebooks like these. Lab notebooks are an indispensable tool, but they don't scale. We have walls of this. <laughs> um, so helping the lab make sense of data over the longer term um, and preserve it for future study is an in-house informatics application that was started well before I joined the lab called Viroverse. Uh, this is a quick example of a detail page for a sample in the Viroverse system. Um, and it's, it's, it's great, but bit rot is a real concern. Uh, and having the data doesn't matter if the software for accessing it doesn't work well uh, or isn't maintained. So when I first started, uh, Viroverse didn't look like the previous picture. Um, it used cobbled together UE2 components uh, everywhere. It was running on Mod Perl. It was using not just a homemade ORM, um, but also class DBI and DBIX class, um, all kind of together, one big happy family. Um, it was version controlled in this unholy combination of centralized CVS and private unshared mercurial repos. Um, and changes would come in in commits like this where there are 14,000 insertions. Um, some synchronization, no explanation. Uh, over about a decade before me, various individuals had made their mark on the application. And after a while, you could pretty much tell who wrote what by how the code looked and how well it functioned. Um, most of the people in my position before me had come to the job with a background primarily in biology and not software. Um, the development practices that have been used were years behind current best practices. And coming from an open source and commercial software background, I saw many opportunities for modernization um, in ways that would help the lab get the work done that they wanted to do. Um, 
it was clear that many improvements in the field from better development tools to design practices to error handling to user experience uh, simply hadn't reached the lab. Um, and I don't attribute this to a lack of caring on the part of the folks before me. They cared deeply about the work they were doing. But I think for all sorts of reasons, ranging from the obtuseness of modern front end stacks to traditional funding structures in biology, um, that advances in software and computing just hadn't reached them yet. They were, weren't aware of them. And so there's this idea in telecommunications that's been applied more generally to providing any good or service. Um, this idea that covering the last mile of distance, i.e. to someone's home, is much harder than providing coverage up to that point. It's this last mile that necessitates your distribution network, whether it's physical or virtual, leaf out immensely and seemingly immeasurably compared to more concentrated service delivery points. Uh, mail services are a good example and typically used. Um, every day the US Postal Service touches often literally every mailbox in America. Uh, the USPS would be a much smaller business if it just had to get mail to regional distribution centers or even local post offices. Um, the difficulty and expense of bridging that last mile is the reason why private mail carriers like UPS and FedEx, as they handled more and more packages with the rise of online shopping, started using USPS for final delivery. Um, that's when your Amazon package takes longer than you want it to show up. Um, so USPS already had a last mile network because it's a much older organization and it had the mandate to do so. So when I first started in the lab, I kind of thought the terrible software was just par for the course because no one cared as long as it appeared to work at least once. Um, but the reality is that people do care. Um, and so I, I see it as this last mile problem. It's not that the field doesn't care about producing bad error prone code that reinvents previously solved wheels over and over again, but that the field doesn't have access to modern practices and technology when it comes to software and more broadly computing. Um, so the tech industry at large, uh, at least you know, in the public eye, is busy building gleaming, glistening towers up in the clouds. And so while it's busy innovating by putting software into everything from toothbrushes to mugs, uh, the industry doesn't seem to have much interest in actually trying to advance other fields by bringing them the bread and butter tech that we've all had for a while now and that we're used to. Things like snappy, reactive web apps that uh, you know, consider user interaction. So I don't see many people who I think of as tech ambassadors, people who try to keep one foot in technology and one foot in some other field and facilitate the transfer of that knowledge. Um, it seems that everyone thinks that tech might just trickle down eventually. Um, and an older name for trickle down theory was horse and sparrow theory. Um, the tech industry is easy to blame, but it's not all at fault, of course. Um, traditional funding structures, as I mentioned before, can make it hard to competitively hire professional developers. Um, and generational and institutional biases often devalue staff roles in science, um, making it harder to justify bringing in outside talent. So neither of these are universal, but they are impediments that are slowing, um, but they are impediments uh, to progress that are slowly over time breaking down. So while I can't affect funding structures at the NIH, um, I can help dispense with the myths that all software and science has to be terrible and that the people writing it have to be trained scientists. Um, perhaps I can even pique your interest. So from day one, my goal was to improve the situation I found. I didn't know much about biology at the time, um, but I knew what rotten software smelled like. And the name of the game was to throw out what was rotten and to keep what was sound and then to build from there. Um, since I didn't have a big picture of what the lab needed at that point, I hope that by just relentlessly trying to improve the computing environment that I found, I would find ways to help everyone out through that. Progress was slow at first, and I spent about my first three weeks converting a mess of a global CVS repository to the best Git repository I could manage. Um, that was as much for my own sanity as the ability to actually make meaningful progress uh, in, a, in a sane way. Um, more weeks were spent improving the deployment infrastructure um, for Vireverse, the lab's primary web application, so that I could deploy changes during working hours without accidentally eating someone's data that they were in the middle of inputting. Um, gradually, tangible improvements compounded, and real progress was easier to make. Um, and about a year later, the results were good enough that I could convince my boss, Jim, to let me hire a coworker to work alongside me. And since then, improvements have been much more rampant, and together we've been able to feasibly tackle larger projects. And I think that's, an, I think that's a, a critical point, is that 
Um, there's a lot of people working in computing and science who are working by themselves and who are become isolated because of that, because they're surrounded by people who don't do the type of things that they do in the lab. Um, and so I, I do think that part of this, uh, part of what's important in getting de software developers into science is to get them in pairs or in threes or in fours or in organized cores that can help multiple labs at once. So what did, what did we learn in the lab? So over these past years, uh, I've learned a lot about how a lab works and how science works. Uh, and I wanted to share those lessons and examples with you. These are lessons that I remind myself of and try to work by, um, because often my default reaction is the opposite of what I've learned. Um, I think they give a nice glimpse into my day-to-day -day role, and I strive to make excellent software for scientists. And so these are, these are the lessons that I try to take to heart. The first is that you should try to enable people to use better practices. And what I mean by this is that um, we, should, we should make it easier for people to follow best practices with whatever work they're doing, rather than to try and force them to do so. Um, a while back, we had an issue in the lab around how sequences were named. Sequences are, um, are the, the DNA, the genetic code that is passed on uh, generation to generation. And this happens in viruses as well as in humans. Um, scientists would generate these sequences in the wet lab and attach a mostly standardized name and then upload them into our database, Fireverse. Uh, but when it came time to do the analysis, instead of downloading the sequences uh, kind of in bulk out from Fireverse, they would collect all the data from dozens of personal folders that were strewn across our shared lab file server. Now, this wasn't ideal because Fireverse was supposed to be the authority of the sequencing data. And it was important to keep the assigned ID numbers that Viraverse g gave to each sequence so that we had data provenance tracking. Um, sequences were also sometimes revised in Viraverse without the data files uh, that were originally imported being updated themselves. And so people ended up using out-of-date data, data that had been you know, QC'd already, and they were using the unQC'd data. The problem was, is that it was hard to find and download all the information you needed. And when you did, each sequence was assigned a name that, as far as anyone was concerned, was just noise to them that got in the way of analysis, or something they had to deal with first before they could get started doing what they really wanted to do. Um, and names looked like this gibberish. Um, this is an insane mix of both fixed length fields with variable length fields in the middle. Um, it's impossible to parse correctly. Um, since the sequences on the file server were more sanely named um, because a human had been involved, people naturally opted to use those instead. Um, so instead of trying to enforce this policy and you know, kind of beat people in the line, we made it easier to get sequences from Fireverse and easier than trawling the file server to find them. So first, we improved searching um, to find the batch of sequences you needed. This was the previous advanced search. Um, it's typical, I've built things like this. You may have built things like this. I think they're bad. Um, they're hard to understand. It requires a bunch of clicking. Um, and you kind of have to know what to punch in to get the results you want uh, beforehand. So what we replaced it with was this faceted search interface, which updates immediately when you click a facet value, one of these values in the list there on the top. Um, and it's immediately graspable just by playing around. Uh, you don't have to already know what kind of values you can search for. You can get a sense of the distribution of values that are in the system just by looking at the list of facets, because um, they're all just shown. Um, so faceted searching is one of those improvements that's kind of all over the tech world. You see it on almost any e-commerce site. You see it in lots of searching. Things like Elasticsearch support it. Um, but I rarely see faceted searches outside of, outside of tech. Um, we're also using a slimmed down version of the same component to replace some data tables um, since it kind of works nicely as a general filter interface for any table that's long. So crucially, now that people had a way to find the sequences they wanted, um, the download process also started letting you choose how you wanted the sequences named. Um, this widget is pretty simple and it's, I mean, as a, as a programmer, it's, it's not really that interesting necessarily uh, on the face of it. Um, but it's intuitive and it's super useful to the scientists. 
So you check all the fields you want in your sequence names, and you can drag those fields around in that list. Um, and that's the order that the sequence names come out in. It's as simple as that. It's kind of you ask what you want for, and you get it. Uh, you can change the delimiter if you want, things like that, and off you go. The data's been tailored to your needs. Um, and so I, that, that's a crucial part, is that when you can provide tailored data um, with a little bit of import, in, input, um, more people will start wanting to use that data. Uh, so people started fetching their sequences from our application, from the authority of this data. Um, they kept the unsigned IDs intact, which meant we could track the provenance of those sequences through an analysis to say, well, what's the reaction that originally generated this? Um, and they didn't have to spend any time renaming sequences themselves with this careful series of find and replace operations in Text Wrangler, or some not so careful uh, series of find and replace operations. So another lesson we've learned is to don't collect data that you don't plan to use. Um, it's tempting, it's very tempting if you're working with a database and collecting data from people just to collect as much as possible um, in the hope that it'll be useful someday. Um, but all it does in the short term is add work for everyone. You have to support it and they have to enter it. And bench scientists already keep detailed lab notebooks, those shelves of things you saw before. So it's not as if the data is gone forever if you actually need it later in a science lab. It might be work to get it, but you can do it. Um, and it also turns out that if you ask scientists to enter information that they know is never used, and they're smart, they'll figure this out, they won't bother to enter it accurately anyway. Uh, you might as well just stop collecting it. It's going to be easier for everyone because you're not going to be able to use the shoddy data. Um, so we ran into this with our sequence upload workflow. Uh, previously, people were required to tediously paint this diagram of how they were submitting their samples to the sequencing facility. Um, and this interface required repetitively dragging over the diagram to specify up to dozens of different values for each sample sequence, and it was all color-coded. Um, it was kind of this mimetic interface that looked like a sequencing plate. Um, and after doing this, they then still had to manually prepare the exact same information in a different format to give to the sequencing facility. Um, and then when they eventually got their results back, they had to upload these several dozen files they got and manually drag and drop them around to match up with the correct locations in these diagrams that they had painstakingly made before. I really wish, I tried very hard to find an image of this so I could show you instead of just describing it to you. Um, but it was one of the very first things we gutted and removed, and I, I simply couldn't find it. Um, <clears throat> good riddance, really. Um, so after they had mashed up their data with this diagram they had drawn, um, <clears throat> it was kind of slow and error prone, and, and ultimately collecting data we didn't need. We didn't care about how exactly it was submitted to the sequencing facility. We cared about the steps in the lab up to that point, and then we cared about the results. Um, and we never used this data in between that they spent, you know, sometimes hours meticulously going through. Um, and also there's this other point, which is that because people realized we didn't use this, they, some of them started fabricating these diagrams in ways that made the data input steps easier, rather in ways that actually reflected the reality of the situation. Um, and so even though we might have had some good data in there that, you know, if we had had a use for it, we could have used, we wouldn't have been able to separate it. So in the end, we replaced it with this kind of simple input workflow. It has a batch, in, uh, a batch upload process, and that upload process um, can just get a drag and drop a bunch of stuff, and then it incorporates heuristics for automatic data matching. So instead of requiring people to uh, match up everything themselves, you kind of do the best job, best effort you can, and then ask them to review what the computer did. Um, and so now all they need to do is review these matches, um, and if they see any mistakes, they can fix it and then save the results. Um, and people were so appreciative of this change because we stopped wasting their time. And that's part of this. If you're not going to use the data, don't, don't collect it. Uh, you're just wasting everyone's time. Um, and, and I think this also highlights something that is uh, very common in a science lab where you're, uh, you're working with things that people do, um, which is that the computer should be this tool that helps them. And so if it can get most of the way or part of the way or kind of do a half-decent job, that's better than doing no job at all if they, they can review those results and fix it. 
So data, once you have it, is also useless unless it's in front of someone's eyeballs. Um, when I first started, a lot of the data we had wasn't very visible to the lab. Um, I had access to it if I knew it existed, uh, which wasn't always the case, being new. Um, and I could pull it up on demand from the database, but the lab didn't always know what data we had or have the ability to see it, so they didn't know to ask for it. Um, invisible data doesn't inspire questions, it doesn't generate hypotheses, it doesn't register as available or pertinent when planning analyses. Um, probably about a third of my overall job is thinking critically about how to best surface and present the data that we already have. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, scientists are naturally curious, and so if there's data in front of them, they'll look at it and they'll ask questions of it and they'll want to know more. Um, and there are all sorts of good ways to get this data in front of people. Um, many people dismiss data tables as kind of boring and immediately reach for plots and charts and diagrams, maybe animated and kind of whiz-bang. Um, but I would take a thoughtful, well-designed data table over a poorly thought out visualization almost any day. Um, and there are all kinds of data tables. You're really not limited. They adapt nicely to different needs and constraints. Um, so you can start simple with this kind of static but information dense table for basic scanning. Um, Spark lines are helpful for increasing information density in this table, um, showing longitudinal data that wouldn't otherwise fit, but is important when skimming this table to find suitable subjects for study um, that we have in our sample repository. Um, from there, you can add things like filtering and sorting by pertinent properties, and the table becomes a little more interactive. Um, you can do things like add graphical labels for easier scanning. Uh, there's another example of not a spark line, but a spark chart there. Uh, and as the data becomes more complex, you can present different views of the data with the same toggle. Um, so these buttons at the top convert the units in the table because depending on what you're doing as a scientist with this information, different un units are easier for some tasks than the others. Now this is really simple. You can copy and paste the data and throw into an Excel and make a new column with a formula and do it, but that's extra work. Who wants to do that? Um, So tables like this you can also you know, filter by arbitrary expressions. Um, and it doesn't have to be limited to, say, just a simple text filter. Imagine the Slack text search box where you have operators. You can be fine-grained, you can be vague, and you can try and just do your best. And sometimes it's nice to interactively link a table with a visualization so that people can flip between the two as they dig into the data. Uh, the previous table you just saw and this plot of data are linked. And so that selecting a curve in the plot, you just click on it, uh, selects the related data in the table and vice versa. And you can toggle what's shown and what's not shown um, and get a sense of what's going on. And when a data table becomes unwieldy, like this kind of all scrolling, all dancing horror, it's a little laggy here, uh, you can upgrade it directly into a visualization and, and regain comprehension. Um, so this is what replace, is replacing that table. And it, it's not only increasing information density, um, that is, it's fitting more information into the same space, um, but also clarity. And there's no more horizontal scrolling. So simple plots are kind of a dime a dozen in science. Um, but good visualizations really integrate and synthesize lots of data in order to highlight relationships within and between groups. Um, and this is, looks like a relatively simple chart. Um, but what it does is compares the performance of this current experiment over thousands of data points for each experiment, um, and then highlights that current experiment and shows you how it relates to other experiments that are related to it. Um, so in this case, it's by the same subject. Um, and so we use this for quality control. And at a glance, instead of staring at reams of data and trying to get a sense of what's the gist of this thing, what's the overall sense of of how we're doing, you can look at something like this. Bad visualizations, on the other hand, they're, they're hard to digest, and they leave you wondering who thought this was a good idea. Um, they're kind of like a pizza with too many toppings. Uh, it's better just to split it up and to have each thing separately. If you want a pizza with, let's, half Hawaiian and half anchovy and mustard, we'll get it half and half, not all together. Um, So another lesson we've learned is, is, is this one. 
Um, and, and it's that designing and building research software is different than building a product to your vision. Um, research software must fit into the workflows that already exist. Uh, and by and large, those workflows are outside of the computer. And you can't dictate what those workflows will be necessarily. Um, you're modeling real world steps that happen in experiments, things that experiments produce, and actions that people perform. Um, you don't typically get to decide what someone does at the lab bench. Um, and so challenges are different from designing many software products or applications, where you can kind of figure out, well, how's this feature going to work exactly? Uh, how do we want people to interact with this? Um, the software in a research lab is in service to the science and the scientific goals, and the job is to save labor, not create it by imposing new demands on people. Um, my colleague, Evan, um, talks about this goal as building right up to the edges of what researchers are already doing. And sometimes I like to think of this as, I won't touch what already works for you. Um, you know, we're going to get as close as possible uh, and kind of take a, carve away some tedium. Um, but you can still doing, do you. So one of my concrete lessons with this uh, was when building a data input widget for counts of cells. Um, this widget mimics the layout of um, a particular device used under a microscope to count alive and dead cells. It's called a hemocytometer. Um, each quadrant, um, these kind of couplets of boxes, uh, gets counted, along with a volume and known dilution. And then the number of cells in the entire dish can be extrapolated from that. Um, and I talked with the scientists a lot about the process of counting cells and the steps and data involved, because I wasn't familiar with it. Um, there were mock-ups and sketches. And I designed the widget with this data entry task in mind. Um, it supports a tally mode designed for use with an external numpad where key presses either tally live or dead cells and you can move between the quadrants and back and forth. Um, you can fully operate it with a single hand and it even includes distinct audio feedback for the keys you've pressed uh, so that you know when you've hit the right one when you're not looking at it. Um, so they could directly enter this data while they were collecting it and I was pretty pleased with this result. Um, after all that thought and effort though, it was barely used as intended. Uh, so what went wrong? Well, see, the scientists are recording these counts while in a biosafety level three lab space. They're in gowns, they're in hats, goggles, they're wearing two gloves on each hand, and it's hot in this small, fully enclosed room. Um, counting cells is mundane, and it's tedious, and it's a lot of time staring down the microscope. And so they streamline the process with two people. One prepares the cells to count, and the other just counts furiously. Um, futzing with a laptop and software to do direct entry, even with the UX affordances that I thought were useful, it was just a non-starter. The goal is to get in and get out of this space as quickly as possible. And so it's much faster to use a physical clicker, just like you'd see at a movie theater, uh, and scribble down numbers on any old piece of paper, and then transcribe that to a spreadsheet when you get back to the comfort of your office. Um, so what did we do? Well, we removed nearly all of that specialized functionality that I was proud of. Um, and we just left the bare bones input widget in case you needed to enter something ad hoc. And the way we do it all now is you download this template Excel file, you fill in your data, you upload the file back, and boom, it's in the database. Um, it's simpler. It was easy. It took less time to build than the other thing. Um, and this met the scientists on their own terms, kind of right up to the edge of what they were already doing. Another good example of this is when we realized our scientists were hand labeling dozens of tiny stickers for every experiment they did. Each sticker's label had to be different, and so even using a word template was kind of laborious for this. Um, in, each, in this photo, each white dot there uh, is a sticker on top of a very small vial. And that's not a giant marker. The stickers are just very tiny. Um, and these aren't normal printable stickers you'd buy at Office Depot either. These are cryo-safe stickers, so they'll stay stuck to vials for years at minus 200 degrees C um, while they chill out in the liquid nitrogen freezer. Uh, so our scientists just buckled down to get the job done every time. And it was obvious that we couldn't let that stand. So after only a couple days of hacking, testing, discussing stickers, getting LaTeX to work, um, our scientists can now come to the lab's tissue culture app, TCOSI, and generate labels based on the relevant data for the experiment that's already in our databases. Um, they were looking it up there to begin with and then kind of printing it out and then going down and writing on stickers. Um, 
And so now they just come in and tell us, tell the app what experiment they're wrapping up and freezing down to put into the freezer for, for safekeeping for later use. And it generates PDFs of stickers and they print those out and they just go to town sticking them on vials. Um, and so once they no longer had to worry about actually labeling the stickers themselves, they started suggesting improvements that would help them find these in the freezer later, like color coding the label text and creating a second sticker for each vial which contained additional information. And these are things that were just unthinkable before because it just would have immensely increased the amount of time. Um, but once they were saying, oh, stickers are easy to make, um, these new ideas came to light. There's also this piece of paper in the background of this picture. And I think it's an interesting piece of paper. Um, it's kind of this table. You can't really read the text on it. Um, but that's a plate setup guide. And so our application produces this as well. Um, you get a, you know, when you, you, when you set up an experiment in the application, um, what you get back from it is a bunch of instrument setup files that go load on the scientific instruments that are going to run the experiment. Uh, so that doesn't have to get manually input. And you also get this PDF of setup guides. And that tells you how to put your samples on these plates that then get put into the instrument to get run. Um, taking a couple hours of our time to produce those automatically is saving the scientists many, many hours of time in the long term. Because they used to look at the data tables, figure out where stuff should go, write down their, make their own chart like this, either in Excel or just by hand, and then take that to the lab bench space and follow it. Um, and so this is another example of saying, this is what you're already doing. Let us do part of that for you. So this, is, this next lesson is learning to be comfortable adapting your models. Um, and it kind of tags along with meeting people where they are. So research science moves rapidly, much more rapidly than most software development can keep pace with, especially when the scientists are likely to outnumber the developers. Um, and scientists will perform an experiment, learn something from it, and then rinse and repeat ad infinitum over and over again, week after week, tweaking not just variables, but also abandoning and adopting entirely different methods. Um, you can't model every experiment. You can't capture all of that data. You can't predict how the data being produced will fundamentally change over time as the way it's being generated changes. Um, Scientists are constantly looking at how they can improve the steps that they're doing and the data they're generating, and so it's drifting. Um, software for bench scientists is so close to the physical world that no simplified abstracted model that we like to work with, uh, none of those models survive the real world very long before needing to be revised. Um, so because of this, I, I've kind of learned to become comfortable making changes to our schemas, to be comfortable changing our object models, uh, to always consider if the problem will be easier by first adapting the model to fit the new reality. Um, all software makes simplifications about the real world in order to make it tractable and understandable. And learning how to start simple and grow more nuanced from there as the needs arise is crucial. We found some good tools and techniques to help cope with rapid schema changes, and I just want to highlight a couple of those. Um, so the first is indispensable. We use David Wheeler's sketch to manage schema changes for our projects. Um, if you haven't heard about it, go check it out. Um, it organizes your schema into sets of deploy, revert, and verify scripts um, with nice dependencies between your change sets declared in a plan file. Um, there's some nice command line tooling and things that lead to really useful diffs in Git. Um, it's pretty good, and I recommend it. It's certainly better than putting your database migration scripts in your commit messages. Who's going to remember to run that before deploying to production? Um, so while Sketch is nice for bringing sanity to the process of making schema changes, sometimes you need the flexibility to start capturing data before you can make those changes, um, before you've made sense of what those changes need to be. Um, other times, you want to capture data that's just inherently variable and annoyingly hard to model relationally. Um, and so a JSON document store is a great option for this. But we didn't really want another database service. We run everything on PG. It's awesome. We love it. Um, and we did actually want the documents themselves tied to other relational objects. Uh, so we used the JSON document store in Postgres. Um, we found it works really well. And the results give us this nice combination of flexibility without throwing out all of our relational integrity or adapting a kind of fully destructured object key value relationship table. Uh, it's easy to start using and provide straightforward upgrade paths to proper relational tables once you're far enough along to know what's worth refactoring into this relational model and what's not. Um, it's also fast. The native JSON types in Postgres are indexable and work well. 
Uh, you can even add check constraints to do basic JSON document validation. And the documents are manip manipulatable, ah, manipulatable and traversable in SQL when you need it, uh, which makes ad hoc queries very easy. This also lets you create views designed for analysis that present the documents as flat tables joined into relevant rows, um, meaning our data scientists don't have to know the document structure or JSON operators in SQL. Um, they can just uh, use this as a normal table, whether that's from R or Python or you know, bringing it into Excel, whatever it is. Excel can talk to your SQL databases. Um, and our DBIX class models have helper methods for certain for searching and filtering on these JSON documents. Um, the document columns themselves are automatically inflated to these typed document classes so that we can constrain them on the application side and work with them as first class objects. Um, this approach also yields nice options for future schema upgrades when you realize that perhaps some of the JSON data should be properly modeled. Since the data is already in the database, it's straightforward to write a migration script uh, in Skitch, of course, moving the data out of those JSON documents and into proper tables. Um, so we use these documents in two ways. One is just as a column directly on a primary record, usually to hold variable metadata. And, uh, and the second way is as this better object key value uh, pattern, kind of an object document pattern, if you will. Uh, and this the document table refers to objects by real foreign keys and can contain other metadata and relationships as necessary. Now, there are definitely quibbles you can have with this coming from a relational model, but it, it works, and it works well. Um, and, and there's there's room to grow when it starts to not work as well. Um, and one tantalizing improvement to this approach that we may try in the future is using our application document models to produce JSON schemas and JSON schemas to produce database check constraints so that we can validate documents regardless of how they enter the database, um, even if they come in directly from an insert. So finally, um, I think the most exciting and important lesson I've learned during my time in the lab is that when you remove the tedium from people's work, you help make space for them to think up new ideas and improvements to their workflows. Um, what's deemed reasonable or even desirable to do changes once these tedious tasks vanish and people can think more creatively about the bigger picture. Um, many of us have likely encountered fundamental misunderstandings about what's easy to make the computer do and what's very, very hard. Um, every visible successful example of automating away tedium is another example of how the computer can work for someone and a closing of that gap of misunderstanding. Um, they can better relate the possibilities to their own tasks. And so at first in the lab, I kind of had to ask around for direct ways that I could help people with their work. Um, but over time, as people saw the successes we were making, they started approaching us to ask about some process they were doing and making it faster or easier or less error prone. So is this for you? Well, the field of biology has a dire need for people who can think computationally and write good software at all levels. Um, the field is currently grappling with how to build out these skills that last mile. Um, currently, demand vastly outstrips supply for computational skills in biology. Uh, there's a general consensus that the field needs to, uh, as a whole, incorporate more bioinformatics and software development training into undergraduate and graduate biology curriculums. And while this certainly must happen to a degree, it's a little like saying, well, to be a successful mechanical engineer, you also need a law degree. Um, the disciplines and practices of bioinformatics and software development are vast, and the practices of biology are vast. And while familiarity and literacy in both you know, bioinformatics and software development is a good goal, it's unreasonable to expect biology students to start mastering multiple fields in the same amount of time. Um, and so there's another strategy that I think should be part of the solution and that other people do as well. And it's starting to come around in the field. This idea of creating staff positions for and recruiting professional software developers into research science. There are interesting and meaningful problems to solve in biology and it's a very different culture than the tech industry, both of which can be attractive selling points to the right people. Um, the rewards of working in a lab are many. You'll learn a new domain, and learning new domains is always fun. There's things to know that you didn't know before. Um, scientists are happy to teach and explain. Um, you'll be doing scientific research where the problems are different than you're used to, and there's broad space for your own thoughts, your own decision making, your own implementations, and getting feedback on all of those in real time. Um, and the pace is often fast and exciting. Um, you can never keep up with these bench scientists, whether they're working on a new assay or just churning through a rote set of experiments. 
um, thinking on your feet is necessary. So you'll build minimum viable products to start capturing data now, and then later figure out how to refine it for ongoing analysis. And as programmers who know Perl, you're well poised to think in terms of both high-level applications and raw data manipulation. You'll be able to deploy regular expressions to save the day multiple times. And most importantly, you don't need a PhD to do this work. Um, but you do need to have empathy and a determination to help others. And I like to think of this as compassionate computing, or software for humans. That's all. Uh, I'd like to thank Evan Silberman, my coworker, for his thoughts and conversations about these topics while we work, and Jim Mullins for his support uh, and then allowing me wide discretion in the lab with what I work on. And thank you for your attention, uh, and I'll take any questions now. Yeah. Every yeah. Yeah. Like those challenges are the same challenges. Yeah. The only exception is trying to build a new science. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's something you know I realize uh, as I was learning these things that they're they're applicable more broadly than just science. Um, but the way I the way I learned not all of them but some of them was through these interactions. Yeah. Over there. Yeah, that's. Uh, I could. I mean, I could do a whole other talk, and maybe I should sometime on on biology because I think the biology behind this stuff is fascinating. Um, but there's there's a lot to talk about there, and there's a lot of background to to bring you up to speed on. Um, so um, some of the more recent work the lab's been doing is, so uh, retroviruses like HIV, they, um, when they enter a human cell, they end up integrating themselves into your cellular genome, um, so into that cell's DNA. Um, and then they get expressed and kind of replicate through that, uh, after that process. Um, and so you might ask, well, how do they, like, where, where do they integrate into your genome? Your genome is huge. It's humongous compared to these tiny viruses. Um, so where do they integrate? Do they have preferential locations and hotspots? Um, are there patterns in the genes that they integrate into? Are there patterns in where they integrate relative to other genomic features? Um, and things like that. And so some of the, the work we're doing currently is to, to look at that data. And it's not data I talked about here. Um, but we've built software and databases and applications for that as well. Um, is to look at those, those sites of integration, those integration sites, um, and see what are the relevant factors. And so there's some papers um, over the last couple of years on some of our preliminary work for this in science. Um, and there's, there's another one coming out soon, I think, in Cell. I'm not sure if it's, I'm not sure what the status of that is, uh, so don't quote me on it. Um, but we're finding that the, the, I, I shouldn't say that because I can't explain the background of it in this amount of time, um, so it would be properly understood. Um, but there are, uh, uh, integration sites with HIV are linked to other uh, genes that are related to other diseases and things like that. Um, yeah, come talk to me in the hallway and, and maybe I can talk your ear off a little more. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, f I feel like they're pretty forgiving, um, and they're very willing to, if it's necessary, you know, if something's necessary, even if it's going to be tedious and boring in hours of their time or all day of their time, they'll just do it because it's what has to get done, and that's kind of the, the work ethic that is in research science. Um, so when they get frustrated is, is more when we've talked about something, and I'm like, oh, yeah, we can totally build that for you. We'll do that. It'll be great. Here's, here's the plan. 
and then life conspires, and we have a million other things to do, and that doesn't happen for a month, or two months, or three months, or six months, and then they come back and like, so could we do this thing? And they're asking the same questions, and I'm like, yeah, oh, we talked about that. I'm sorry. Um, and so I feel like that's, that's when they get frustrated. Um, and in terms of talking to them about uh, kind of specking out the work, um, one of the most useful things, if it is directly related to the, what they're doing at the bench, is to go into the lab and watch them do it and ask questions as they do it. And you know, so don't just show up behind their shoulder, but just say, hey, can I, hey, Dylan, can I watch you do this a couple times? You know, when's a good time for you when I'm not going to distract you? Um, and can I just watch you do it and pester you with questions about what's going on? And all the assumptions that you're, you know, you're making that I know or that you think I know, but I don't actually know, or I want to more fully understand so I can model it. Um, so that's probably the most valuable technique, is sitting down and sketching at a whiteboard and talking it out and then seeing it, seeing it, or really seeing it first, and then once I've processed it, getting them back in a room and, and sketching out and saying, here's what I'm thinking, am I missing anything? Is, what's wrong here? Yeah. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>